Okay, Milky, what can you tell me about the first consonant shift? Okay, um, there are these sounds um, that changed. Um, well, it was an important change. Um, I see you haven't started. Do you think you can pass the exam this way? You'll end up cleaning toilets for a living. I'm sorry, Fabio, but I didn't understand anything. This consonant shift is too complicated. Okay, okay, let's start again from the beginning. But this is the last time, okay? So, last time we have learned a few things about the Germanic languages. We mentioned the most important ones which are spoken today. We also said some of them disappeared. We know they can be roughly divided into three groups, North, West and East Germanic. And we also tried to describe some of them, listing a few features. Kid stuff. But now it's time to get serious, because we're going to talk about the scary monster that likes eating linguistic students. Its name is phonology. All kidding aside, I think phonology is wonderful, because thanks to this science we understand that the assertion you can't learn to speak a language like a native is totally false. The first reaction, shock! The sounds of a language can be reproduced by every single person in the world. What you need is just to study how the specific sounds are produced and, of course, to train, in order to make this sound flow as natural as possible when you have to talk fast. Anyway, let's get back to our topic. When Germanic began to separate from the Indo-European language, people developed a new way to articulate some of the sounds, both vowels and consonants. The accent changed as well, the words changed, they also changed the way words were connected in sentences, they changed the way they used to describe actions in the flow of time, they changed everything. And as I told you, one of the things that changed was the consonant pattern. If we want to understand the details of this phenomenon, we need to start by describing the sounds of the Indo-European system. Let's focus on what we call plosive sounds, that is those consonants where the air stops behind a barrier. For example, the two closed lips or the tongue touching the palate. And then it is suddenly released, producing a sharp sound something like a small explosion. Take for instance the sounds p, b, t, d, k, g. Most people think Indo-European had three kinds of plosive sounds that could be produced in five different places of articulation. There were voiceless plosives, that is without vibration of the vocal cords, p, t, k, there were the voiced ones with vibration of the vocal cords b, d, g and there were also aspirated voiced plosives that is the same as the previous ones but followed by like in help b, d, g these sounds could be bilabial that is articulated with both lips respectively p, b B, dental with the tip of the tongue against the upper front teeth, t, d, d, velar with the back of the tongue on the back of the palate, k, g, g, and labial velar, which are like the previous ones but with rounded lips, q, q, q. Most scholars agree that there could have been also palatal plosives, pronounced with the central part of the tongue on the palate. G, G, G. But they evolved in Germanic the same way the velar sounds did. Therefore, we will use the word velar for both kinds. I wonder why they didn't have this sound. So, summing up, Let's say that we will take into consideration, for the Indo-European language, 12 different plosive sounds, 3 different manners of articulation, multiplied by 4 different places of articulation. Ok, this was the situation before Germanic emerged. What happened then to these sounds as the new language separating from the Indo-European? Let's try to understand it. Ok, imagine this. 
When people pronounce a pure voiceless plosive sound, in the beginning the air finds a first wall in the glottis. Then the glottis is opened and the air goes straight to the next wall, which are the lips or the tongue touching the palate or whatever it is. The time between the opening of the glottis and that of the next obstacle is so short that the pressure of the air has exactly the energy it needs to break the second obstacle and produce a pure plosive sound. This happens in a lot of languages. Take the first sounds in Italian pane, French touché, Greek cala. Now, let's imagine that Germanic and the Germanic languages today have a little bug. They always remember that they have to use the glottis. That means that in the same situation described before, the air doesn't find an obstacle in the glottis, because the glottis is still relaxed and open. As a consequence, for a few instants, the air flows into the mouth, finding the second wall, the lips, the tongue, or whatever it is. This leads to a huge accumulation of air in the mouth, with the result that when lips are opened, this big amount of air is released and sounds like a puff. Not just p, but p. And that's what we have today in most Germanic languages. Think about the difference between Italian pane and English pain or German panne. This delay in the use of the glottis is very important because it's a principle that explains most of the changes of the first consonant shift, but also later changes that occurred in the single Germanic languages. So let's go back to the Indo-European P, which turns into P in Germanic. When followed by H, the strength of that air flowing after the sound can easily make the plosive weaker, which means that the articulation can consequently become less strong. The lips can be articulated not as tight and as they should be, with the result that the plosive becomes a fricative. Fricative means that the air flows between two sides, which are not completely closed, but enough to produce something like a short hiss. The result is that Indo-European P, which is the same simple sound we have in Italian pane, becomes in an early stage of Germanic P, the same sound we have today in English pain, and then F, which is the sound you produce when your soup is too hot and you have to blow on it to cool it down if you don't want your tongue to be burned. This last sound eventually evolved from bilabial f to labial dental f, like the first sound of English fish. The same glottal delay gives the following evolution. K, like in Italian cane, turns into k, like in English car, and then we have h, like the last sound of German bach which eventually becomes a simple glottal sound like in English help. T, like French tu, becomes t, approximately like German toll, and then th, like the first sound in English thank. Summing up, the first consequence of this consonant shift is that all voiceless plosives become voiceless fricatives. Before we start with some examples, it's important for you to know that all Indo-European and Proto-Germanic roots are reconstructed. We infer their existence by comparing documented languages, but we have no real evidence. That's why you always find an asterisk before these words. Let's start with P becoming F. The Indo-European reconstructed stem POR, which probably meant something like to go through, evolved into Italian porto, which means port, Greek poros, which means passage, but German fahren, to drive, or the English word fair. T became th. For example, Indo-European tre, meaning three, becomes tre in Italian, and the sound t is preserved in most other Indo-European languages, but it evolved into Proto-Germanic three, and three in English. K turns into H. For example, we have Indo-European Kmtum, hundred, which becomes Kentum in Latin, but Hundan in Germanic, leading to Old English Hund. And then we have the labiovelar sounds. K becomes H. For example, Indo-European Quad, what, and we find Quad in Latin, but what in English, where the velar or glottal sound 
can still be heard in some variants of the language. What? The glottal delay also caused problems in the production of voiced plosives, that is b, d, g. Voiced sounds are characterized by the vibration of the vocal cords. This is the element that makes a voice sound different from the equivalent voiceless sound. Take for instance p, which is voiceless, and b, voiced. Vocal cords are a part of the glottis. If you have a glottal delay, then you also have a delay in using the vocal cords. This delay might become so strong that the sound loses completely its voiced element. And that's why we have b becoming p, d becoming t, g becoming k, and g becoming k. Let's see some examples. b developed to p, for example in Indo-European teub, deep, which became deep in English but dubus in Lithuanian. d became t, for example Indo-European dekemt, which is the word for ten, we have an original t sound for all Germanic languages, but d in the others. See Latin decem or ancient Greek deca. G turns into k. In fact, in Indo European we have gneu, which gave English ni, whereby the k sound was still pronounced a few centuries ago, kne, but genu in Latin. G becomes Indo-European Gwen, which used to mean woman, evolved into Gune in ancient Greek, but we have the word queen in English, coming from the same stem. The third and last step of this consonant shift concerns the so-called aspirated voiced plosives. This is quite easy because these sounds just lost their sound. So B became B, D became D, G became G, and G became gu. In weak position, however, which means usually between vowels, these sounds became even weaker, that is, voiced fricatives. V, th, r, r. Let's see some examples. B became b in Indo-European ber, to bear. As you can see in English, only the sound was lost. It evolved differently in other languages, though. See Latin ferro or Greek ferro, verbs bearing the same meaning. Let's go now to the weak position. As it happened for the equivalent voiceless sound, bilabial becomes most of the times labial dental. So, v becomes v, like the last sound in English give. An example is Indo European gerp, to grab, which produced English give. D becomes D, Indo-European dur, which means door, whereby we still have the plosive sound in English, but other sounds in other languages. See the same word in ancient Greek, tura. D can also become V, for example, Indo-European medu, which means honey or mead, and we have miodr in Old Icelandic. G evolved into G, for example, Indo-European gostis, guest, whereby we have the g sound in English or in German, gast, but other sounds in other languages, for example Latin hostis, which also changed totally meaning to enemy. In weak position, g becomes r. For example, Indo-European steg, to climb, where we have the same stem and meaning in Gothic stiran. This r sound returned to g or disappeared completely in most Germanic languages. The sound k most of the times became r and eventually just w, like Indo-European guerm, war, which is for example termos, with a dental sound in Greek. Okay, so before the end of the lesson I'd like to say something about this glottal delay I was talking about. This theory is not widespread. There's only one book I found, and it's kind of old, I have to say, where this idea is clearly explained. It's a book from Antoine Meillet, which is almost 100 years old, but I have to say, first, this theory explains a lot of tendencies that are taking place still today in the Germanic languages. For example, we were saying before that in languages like English and German, people tend to pronounce a 
sound after or for example in German most voice sounds are not so voiced as they are in other languages you could hear sometimes German saying Bein and not Bein whereby the vibration of the vocal cords is weaker than it should be in a normal voiced sound moreover as you can see this theory helps us remember all the changes of the first consonant shift and I have to say I will remember this until the end of my days without needing to go over it several times I don't know why this explanation is not so widely spread well if you are a professor of linguistics and you want to help me understand just tell me what you think about it next time we'll have a look at the vowel system of Germanic remember if you like the lesson and you haven't subscribed yet just do it otherwise you're gonna miss my next lessons and click on the bell icon as well if you want to get knocked on the head every time I upload a new video. That's it for the moment. See you and behave yourselves.